Before I get started today, uh, anybody have an opportunity that God has given you in the past week to lean in to unfairness? Remember the whole idea of turning the other cheek. I actually, you know, we, we pray for God to give us that opportunity. I have a guy like yelling at me, screaming at me, and then he peed directly in my face. It's like diaper changes are really rough. <laughs> Turn the other cheek. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, chance that God has given you. As we get started here, uh, we're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, I need a volunteer. Somebody to come up. All you have to do is draw a circle. All right, come on up. Uh, just, just to refresh your memory. Okay. I have that circle as a shape. All right, yep, there you go. Do your best. All right, maybe try it a little bit darker so they can see. All right, not bad, not bad. You did go to art school, right? Oh, no, that's natural. <laughs> I mean, I even gave you a cheat sheet. That's not, it's a little wobbly. I mean, I love you, Miss Kathy, but. I'm wobbly. Okay. <laughs> it's a hand that draws it. Uh, I mean, I gave you a cheat sheet. Uh, but here's the truth, though. Like, even the circle on the screen is not a perfect circle. I, I took the same image, and if you zoom in uh, on the line, it it's pixelated. And, and even what you're looking at on the screen is pixelated. And, in fact, any circle that we attempt to make using a physical object, if you zoom in close enough, you're going to see like the bumpy, wavy lines of the individual atoms or quarks and neutrinos and stuff like that. It's all crooked. This depends on how closely you look, just like all of us. Because today we're talking about love, and specifically loving our enemies. And I've never met anybody who described themselves as an unloving, hateful, spiteful person, right? Just like we all would say, oh, I know what a circle is. The question comes in our ability to implement it fully in our lives. That's not exactly a circle. Can your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 5? We'll continue in verse 43. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Sounds pretty easy, right? So let's, let's jump in at the beginning of this. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, in the rest of the sermon so far, he's been directly quoting Old Testament laws and people's understanding of them. And so here he's quoting uh, from the book of Leviticus. And, and here's the reference. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Notice something missing there. The second half of what Jesus says. That you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, hate your enemy is not anywhere in that passage. How did we get it? It's basically human nature that we cannot conceive. You know, if God draws a circle around all of humanity and says, love these people, we immediately begin to add other stuff on the outside of that. It's like I went to a, a country store one time, way out in, in the middle of nowhere, and we stopped there for lunch on the work crew, and I ordered a sandwich, and I was like, I, I just want a ham and cheese plain. She's like, all right, plain, just mayonnaise. It's like, no, no, just, just meat, cheese, bread. And she, it, it did not compute with her. She's like, 
You mean you don't want no mayonnaise? She had no conception of a sandwich that could exist without mayonnaise on it. And, and so here's what we do. God says, all right, love everybody. And we're like, you got it? And we're like, yes, sir. We got it. Love everybody except my enemies. You know, we, we want to add like these little circles, right, of, of people outside that this doesn't apply to. Like, oh, I want to love everybody uh, except for like people who put pineapples on pizza or drive slow in the left-hand lane, or my in-laws, or people who like cats. And we just want to add all these extra categories. So we say, well, I love my neighbor except for you. And so that's what the, the so Jesus is referring, referencing either a common saying or approach to loving your neighbor. And, and so... This, this, again, we, we find this in the Bible. After Jesus is teaching and he tells them the most important commandment, love God, and then the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the immediate follow-up. Somebody listened to him in Luke chapter 10. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because, he, again, he's trying to find these exceptions to the rule for himself because he knew the truth is we don't love everybody. Jesus says, let me clear this up for you. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus says, actually, guys, no, you don't get to add other categories. You're going to have enemies, but they fall within that circle of people that you're supposed to love. Last week we talked about leaning into the unfairness of situations, but honestly, this is on a deeper level because Jesus here speaks to the issues of our heart. Tell me, which is easier, going the extra mile for your idiot boss or loving him? Because we can do all kinds of stuff for people in a way that doesn't even scratch the surface of our heart. Jesus here is not just saying, be polite to your enemies. He's saying, love them. Pray for them. And he's not talking about loving people who are slightly annoying. He's those who persecute you. Those who treat you unfairly, like, because of your faith. Those people I want you to love. Now, we don't do this, though. Recently, there's a street preacher in Canada, and I watched the video. Uh, he was, like, filming himself, and he had people there with him, and they were, they were holding a, a gay pride parade. And he was just going to people with his microphone and asking them, you're holding a sign that says, love is love. Do you love and accept me? I am a Christian. And the people holding the sign saying, love is love is love, were like screaming at him, cussing in his face, and called the cops on him. Their whole idea of, of loving everybody, really, they're drawing their circle, and they get to like the Christian community, and they're like, we're just going to cut that slice out. Love and tolerance, you guys. But let me ask you a question. They're crooked. All the talk about universal love is hypocritical. But are we any better in the church? Because really, at the same time this is happening, I've got, anybody have this, this phenomenon? You've got relatives like on Facebook that you're not quite sure what to do with? Right? So I've got one of those. And his ministry... That same week, went to another, like, you know, pride event, and literally the guy is walking around with a megaphone and a giant sign, yelling at people, calling them, you wicked sinners, you're a demon. That's his ministry. And so what he's done, he's like, all right, you're going to cut us out of your circle? We're going to draw our circle here. You're out of ours. 
I mean, we'll say we're doing it in love, but our actions are clearly not based in love. I'm not immune to this. I was reading an article aimed at pastors. And it asks the question, it says, be honest, right now, can you name a pastor that you would secretly enjoy watching them crash and burn? Or get caught up in a scandal or struggle in their ministry? And it was one of those moments where, like, you're right, but I don't like that you're right. And it really made me spend time thinking about, like, man, the truth is, sometimes we're not even drawing a circle. We've got to point ourselves. That's who we're out for. And, and the truth is, and, and the, the brutal honesty of the article is, like, most ministers would say, if I'm not trying to look good, like, yeah, there's somebody I, I wouldn't mind seeing struggle with. So Jesus says, love your enemies. And then he goes on, he says, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And here in Missouri, we're like, God, you can stop sending the rain anytime. He says, love your enemies, and you get to then look like your father in heaven, because that's what he does. Families, you know what this is like, right, husbands? Your kid does something reckless or ill-advised, and what do they say? That's your kid. He looks just like you when he does that. So, so how do we take on our daddy's eyes? in our treatment of our enemies. Now here is human nature, right? There is a dentist in Poland, and she did some dental work on an ex-boyfriend. And instead of filling the cavity or whatever she was supposed to do, she pulled out every single one of his teeth. And everybody goes, oh, and then somebody like, I need to take up dentistry. Right, that, that is your nature. That is how mankind deals with our enemies. But if you want to look like your father who is in heaven, how does God love his enemies? Jesus says, God gives sunshine and rain to everyone. Have you ever considered all the joys of a life that God gives even to people that he knows will curse him to their final breath? He lets them walk on his earth, breathe air that they didn't make. Everything of beauty that they enjoy is his creation. It's not like they're paying bills to keep the sun shining. In fact, God is so merciful to people who reject him, it messes with people's faith. Multiple times in the Bible, people directly to God say, God, I don't understand. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do you allow them to enjoy stuff? I can't think of a single time in the Bible where people uh, directly question God about his justice. In terms of punishment of the wicked, it messes with people more like, God, you are so gracious to people who hate you. I don't like it. No, yeah, God is just. There will be wrath for those who refuse the gospel. But we are specifically told, one, vengeance belongs to God alone. And two, that we are to imitate God and his surprising grace to everyone. But we're crooked. He's gone. He says, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You know, there are some people who are just easy to love. Don't you like being around people like that? 
I mean, they're warm and friendly. They always have a kind word. Can you imagine anybody coming to you and you, you, Miss Maisie comes up in conversation and somebody says, oh, I hate her. What is wrong? I can't, I can't imagine any human being on this planet who can have an issue with Miss Maisie. All right, easy to love. Not everybody's like that. There are other people who are really difficult to love. Mean-spirited, backstabbing Packers fans. <laughs> you wore the shirt today, man. <laughs> right? Everybody likes the idea of universal love until... And, and, and again, here's the thing. When we draw the circles of our life so often, we're like doing really good, and then you run right into one of those people, and you just want to... But he says, look, everybody loves people in the middle. Everybody does that. Meth dealers do that. How are you any different than them? So if you greet people who greet you, uh, in that culture, public greetings were incredibly important. It, it was a way of showing social status and recognition. And we do kind of the same thing here in this town. Be honest right now. Don't lie to me. Have you ever been in Harps or Town and Country and seen somebody walking and they go down an aisle and you decide you don't really need to grab soup today? Because you don't really feel like having that conversation with that person? It's human nature, right? We greet people who we're close to. You want to observe this in, in, in real life, just go to any church potluck and watch who people sit next to, right? They go, they sit next to people they know, they're kinful, people they're close to. Don't miss how insulting this is to a Jewish audience. Jesus repeats it for emphasis. You're just like tax collectors. You're just like the unwashed Gentiles. You're no different than the worst of sinners. You're no different than the unclean heathens that you won't even eat with. And again, don't fall into the trap of thinking that Jesus is saying all this just to tell you, now you better try harder. Miss Kathy, if I gave you a thousand tries, could you succeed in drawing a perfect circle on this board? If I told you, well, you just need to try harder, there's, there's no point at which you're going to arrive at that perfection. There's always going to be, however small, tiny flaws in the way that you put it into practice. And, and again, here's what Jesus says in summation. Therefore, you must be, what? Perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, this kind of wraps up this section. Remember, uh, weeks ago, right? Jesus said that your righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees, which for most people, they would have been, well, I'm not living up to that. And here, he wraps this section up with, just so we're clear, God is the standard of perfection that you're not reaching. You need to draw something that is perfect and unchanging and unwavering. So we all say, well, I can't. I mean, not just that I can't, I can't even get close. And I was thinking of saying it would be like telling somebody to swim from California to China. But there was actually a dude, I looked it up, there was actually a dude who started to do that, like the other way, and he got like 1,200 miles before he had some sail problems. So no, it'd be like saying, you got to swim to the moon. You don't make it. Now Jesus, though, perfectly modeled this behavior. I want you to consider the way that Jesus approached people who others tended to avoid. In John chapter 4, Jesus goes and approaches a Samaritan woman at the well who he discovers has five husbands, and the guy she's living with now is not her husband. And, and understand, for a Jewish context, 
<laughs> that would be like Jesus stopping to talk to a socialist, gender queer, Muslim, illegal immigrant. Right? Because she's like, why are you talking to me? At least in this area. In other areas, it'd be like Jesus stopping to talk to an old white dude in a Trump hat. Right? People we don't normally associate with. He sought her out. He had a conversation. Jesus applauded the faith of a Roman centurion in a culture that hated everything that had to do with Rome. He had a late night conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. It contains perhaps the briefest statement of the gospel. He washed the feet of Judas knowing that he was about to leave and sell him out. More specifically, Jesus pursued you when you were his enemy. How does God love his enemies? We see it on the cross. So what do we do with this? Of course, it begins with understanding that the only way that we're going to get to the perfection of God is that it's given to us as a gift. It was only made possible through the death and resurrection of Jesus. But then as we go from there and say, okay, what does it look like to follow him? Did you know that there are actual freehand circle drawing championships? It perhaps shouldn't surprise I mean, in our country, we've got air guitar championships, uh, national rock, paper, scissors championships. So, of course, like freehand circle drawing. And, and you might be like, oh, oh, that's boring. Check this guy out. This is like the world champion at freehand circle drawing. That is incredible. And, and so what this looks like in the Christian life is just like those guys who, who spend their time devoted to this. Now, they understand they're not drawing something that is flawless. So I know it's not perfect, but that is what I am pursuing. Now, I can't really think of any practical use for being able to draw a really nice circle. But... If you want to have joy in your life, in your family, at work, in your marriage, with your kids, learn to love your enemies. Because you might not be looking at them right now saying, oh, that's my enemy. I promise you, we all know. There are times where like, loving my enemy is directly applicable to my marriage right now. Your kid pees in your face at five in the morning. Find somebody that you would not normally greet. Be friendly with them. You know, God is, again, very, very faithful in my sermon preparation for this week, uh, revealed a very specific thing that I need to do along these lines. And I'm going to go do it. Now again, we, we, we begin to attempt to do this, and you have to understand you're not going to accomplish this in your own strength. Because our natural grain is running entirely the opposite direction. It is only the power of God that changes our hearts that begins to make this stuff possible. And it's not easy. And so where we get our strength in doing that is spending time dwelling on the fact that Christ died for the ungodly. That he died for me. So, so when I find myself trapped in that loop of this is unjust, they're evil, they've been evil to me, I can't let this go and just dwelling on the unfairness of the situation every single time Jesus brings me back to focusing on the cross and the fact that he died for me and the more I look at that the more petty my disagreements feel and so today we close with communion I can't think of a better illustration tangible expression of the way that God loves his enemies Remember the words of Jesus that he, he takes the bread and he breaks it saying, this is my body, just given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the cup, which is the cup of the new covenant, which is in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And so as we, we close in song today, what I would like you to do, we've got the cup and the bread up here. First, spend time in prayer considering what God has done on your behalf. And then come forward as, as you would like to and take the elements up here and return to your seat. Let's pray. God, I ask that most of all, in everything we do, our eyes will be turned to you, to a grace that we cannot understand, a love that reaches beyond borders and boundaries, that you pursue the ungodly and your enemies, you pursue us. The closer, the closer we look at you, the more we find ourselves changed in the process. Lord, I ask that coming out of that, you would give us the boldness and the strength to follow you in a way that's so radically different than the world around us. In Jesus' name.